He jumps bail and heads for the Ecuadorian embassy. And then do you think that decision was justifiable to jump bail, let's say, and why did he do it? And then why, of all places, the Ecuadorian embassy? Um, well, why the Ecuadorian embassy? It was because Ecuador at the time had taken a very um, sort of independent uh, sovereign uh, position vis-a-vis -vis the United States. So the United States had had its biggest um, naval base, I think, in, in Ecuador, in, in the world, well, in, at least in Latin America, uh, in Ecuador, and they had kicked out the U.S. base and also had a very kind of uh, uh, proud uh, position. They said, well, you can have our, your base here if we can have our base in Miami. Um, so they were, they were changing the rules of the geopolitical game. And um, so this ballsy attitude of uh, the president at the time, Rafael Correa, uh, suggested that they would, they would uh, be willing to protect Julian. And Julian went into, into the embassy on the 19th of June, 2012. And uh, he had exhausted all his uh, domestic remedies in the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom was giving uh, just a few days uh, before he would he would be taken off to Sweden. In Sweden, you have an extraordinary um, pretrial detention um, regime. So it would make he would be in prison from the moment he uh, arrived in in Sweden, even though he wasn't charged. And interestingly, because Sweden is is very interesting country, and they, they kind of play the stats. So I think, uh, I don't know if it's still true now, but for example, they have very low, uh, or at least they did a few years ago, um, one of the, the shortest sentence times um, for convicted prisoners. Uh, and that was partly explained because they also had the longest pretrial detention time, so that by the time they were convicted, they had already served, um, you know, their, their, their potential sentence. Uh, so Julian would be going into a Swedish prison in a country where he didn't speak the language. But most importantly, uh, Sweden had uh, renditioned two asylum seekers. This is one of the most uh, egregious cases of of extraordinary, extraordinary rendition um, in which two asylum seekers were taken on a CIA flight in Sweden, were, were handed over by Swedish authorities uh, to the CIA, where they were flown to Egypt, which was their country of origin, and they were tortured. And then eventually they were able to take their cases to the Human Rights Committee at the United Nations, and uh, they won. And the uh, also the... the um, Torture Committee uh, found in their favor and said that the uh, that Sweden had violated its obligations not to hand over a person to the country um, that where they they risk being tortured or killed. Um, so and on top of that, of all the extradition cases uh, that had gone uh, before from the year two thousand, Sweden had extradited every single person that the U.S. had asked for. So the U Sweden was in, uh, uh, you know, Sweden has this self-image and it also has amazing marketing in the world. It has, uh, uh, you know, this, this image of fairness and so on. And you spoke to Swedes and they'd say, oh, well, if he came here, of course, we would, you know, it would be unthinkable. But what I've come to learn with Julian is that the unthinkable becomes reality when it comes to him. He is, he is. It seems to happen all the time. Yeah, well, they create this, he, he is an exception to the rule, but what's actually happening is that they're creating a new rule with his exception um, that will then, that is then normalized. So it, if you look at the, the persecution that has occurred against Julian over time, now you see a lot of no platforming by PayPal, for example of uh, people with platforms that are critical of, for example, the war on Ukraine or whatever. Um, PayPal and Bank of America and Visa and MasterCard, for the very first time in 2010, 
created a banking blockade against WikiLeaks. They blocked WikiLeaks from receiving uh-huh. Uh-huh. donations from right. um, from people who wanted to donate because WikiLeaks was, you know, on, on a global scale, this great new phenomenon. And WikiLeaks is always just that's an appallingly that's an appallingly fascist. Precedent. And and it started. And you yeah. see, saw it reflected recently in Canada with the government's decision there to seize the bank accounts on oh, the entire financial operations of anyone who they deemed inappropriate in relationship to their donations to the I trucker convoy, which was huh, for very much a tempest in a teapot. Yes, it was. It was the most utterly appalling thing that our absolutely utterly appalling prime minister has ever done, and that's really saying something because he's a real piece of work. And so, yeah, this this collusion of corporate enterprise and government in relationship to personal finance and the funding of, let's say, political or journalistic causes is an unbelievably dire threat 